In this video, I'm going to be watching some falconry or bird of prey related scenes in some different films um, and giving my opinion um, as somebody who owns and works with birds of prey in real life. So for this video, I've got a few uh, films to look at. We're going to have a look at uh, Kez. Um, if you've not seen that, go and watch it. It's a great film. Uh, Mulan, a couple of scenes from Mulan, the Disney film. Uh, a couple of the Harry Potter films. And then lastly, we're going to have a look at a scene from Jurassic World, which might think why there's no falconry in Jurassic World, but there is some interesting training techniques used, um, so we're going to have a look at that. But, without further ado, let's take a look at Kez. This is such a great film, I love this film. That music is so nice to listen to. <laughs> it's very comforting. It's all based around Yorkshire, and I'm also from Yorkshire, and it's about a kestrel and a young lad getting into falconry, um, so I really enjoy this film. If you've not seen it, go and watch it. So Billy Casper here, he's kind of just doing what I used to do as a child. He's just messing about sticks and walking around the woods whacking some leaves and things is exactly what I spent my childhood doing. And then he stumbles across a kestrel's nest. And the kestrel flies out of the um, this big wall, like a little crevice in the wall that it's nesting in. Um, and he stands and watches them for a while. There's a pair of them, it's a breeding pair. So he stands and watches them for a while. footage is so old, it's, it's impossible to tell which one's the male and which one's the female whilst they're in the air like that. <sighs> but he's mesmerised. Oh, there's a bit of hovering. So, knowing the Kestrels had chicks in their nest, Billy Casper has snuck back very early in the morning and he's climbing up the wall and he is going to take one of the chicks. Um, now this was filmed and released in the 1960s um, and this was legal back then um, but this would be completely illegal nowadays. Um, in 1981 um, we have the introduction of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, um, which makes this whole activity that is going on at the moment uh, illegal. But he's climbed up, and then he's... Three good meals a day are given for about a fortnight. If a piece of meat held between the finger and thumb of the gloved hand is offered to the hawk, it will probably bend down and pull at the meat with its beak. So he's reading from a book, I'm not sure which book it is actually. I might have to go and have a look through my books and see see what book he's referencing there. And he's just he's gone into the Avery and she's just he's just gonna go and offer her a small piece of food. So she's still a still still a very young kestrel. She's got a, a blue beak and it's all blue around her eyes, whereas typically an adult would have the yellow. She's in her juvenile plumage, um, and she's even got a little bit of down feather. We'll come uh, down feather. Indoors. She may be down fluff still on top of her head. It's quite likely that although she was coming to the first feast promptly indoors, she will now refuse to come at all. She will stand looking fearfully around her and ignoring the meat and the fish thrust in front of her. So this is kind of the next stage of training. He's put her on a post and he's just going to hold... Okay, well that's an interesting way of doing it, but he's holding the leash with one arm and the glove 
with a different arm just to just to try and get the bird to do a jump sort of full length of the leash. Oh God, watch the tail. Look. When she will come a leash length out of doors, she can be called greater distances by means of crayons. So crayons is a long cord which is attached to the hawk to prevent her escaping. Oh, he's just explained it. With look, she will not attempt to fly it's away. Basically, a training line used in falconry. Which is the stage that we're about to watch now. So she's coming to the fist from a short distance. So he's put her on a on a crayons, um, put her back on the post, and he's calling her from further distance. Um, he's got a very strange position with his arm. Usually we would go across ourselves like that, because then as the bird comes to you, it lands on the glove. So then when you spin your arm around like that, you and the bird are facing the same way. But he's calling the bird like that, which means she's landing in a strange position. This is a different bird. Was that a different bird? I think that was, I think they would use two different birds there. Um, the tail changed colour. It went from being a juvenile with a brown tail to having that sort of bluish slaty colour that the adult male kestrels have. Maybe they used two, multiple different birds uh, for the different scenes and training. But anyway. So in this scene, his teacher's come to watch him and he's, he's now progressed um, rather than calling Kestrel to the fist, he's swinging a lure for it. <laughs> and he's doing exactly what Igor does to me. It's, it's battering him, it's pestering him like a bee after that lure. I think the Kestrel caught him out, so he's, he's going to have another go. It's a very, la a very fast low swing. <laughs> he's doing well. That's some lovely footage. That was a nice pass. If you've not seen Kez, I'm going to have to give you a spoiler <laughs> warning, but it came out in the 60s, so is it really a spoiler by this point? Um, it's got quite a sad ending. Um, his brother has killed his Kestrel, but Billy Casper doesn't know that his Kestrel has been killed, so now he's frantically uh, looking for Kez. So he's now charging around an open field, shouting frantically for his birds, swinging his lure. We've all been here before, but this was before the days of telemetry. So, there's no way of tracking his bird. All he can do is go out and swing his lure, chuck it up in the air. I've done exactly the same thing. Frantically shouting for your bird. Unfortunately, he has no idea that the bird is actually dead by this point. I, I have done exactly the same. You find somewhere higher up, even if it's just a fence, you think that you've got a, a better advantage. So you climb the fence and you swing and you chuck that lure up in the air in the hopes that the falcon might see you and come back down to you. But unfortunately, it's not going to happen for Billy Casper this time. So, moving on. Um, we're going to have a, a look at a couple of scenes from Mulan. So this is the avalanche scene from Mulan, um, and the, the dude on the horse who I... I don't really know the plot of Mulan. I'm assuming he's a Mongolian. Like Genghis Khan, 
But he has this bird, uh, the bird has taken off. Um, I think it's supposed to be a falcon, but that obviously was not a falcon's noise, that was much more of a buzzard's noise, um, which is confusing. But that happens loads in films and TV programs. Um, if you ever see like an eagle flying around and it makes that call, it's, it's never an eagle's call, it's always a buzzard's noise. So we get another close look at the falcon here, as it goes into, oh, a lovely stoop. So, um, again, not a falcon's noise. Um, strangely, it's kind of got the plumage of maybe a, a juvenile peregrine. It's a lot darker, browner, but it's got the eyes, uh, skin and feet of a, an adult. Um, I don't know, it's not very accurate, whatever it is, um, but I think it's a peregrine falcon. And so his, this guy's glove is on his left hand, which is how we hold the birds, it's the hand that we wear our glove in, in, in this country, our left hand, um, but traditionally over in Mongolia that's incorrect, they would actually be holding the glove uh, on their right hand, uh, he's not using it anyway, the, the, the peregrine's just got a perch on his shoulder anyway, um, but over in, in Mongolia it's a, a strange position to be holding your arm in, it's interesting. So over in Mongolia um, they hold their birds on their right hand, their strong dominant hand. Um, as it spread over into England, back in the old day, traditionally, um, you would hold the reins of your horse with your um, right hand. So we swapped to holding the bird in our left hand. Um, so it's not entirely accurate for him to be holding his bird on his left hand from this sort of time period and region uh, around the world. Um, so shouldn't really be having a peregrine, shouldn't really be having it on his left hand. Um, not at all any peregrine noises, um, but at least they showed off a lovely sort of peregrine stoop. Okay, moving on, we're going to take a look at Harry Potter. This is the first film and Harry's now in uh, Diagon Alley, and he's about to go and do all of his shopping for all of his wizarding stuff. Oh, and immediately, there we go, tethered owls. Owls in tiny little cages. Please do not believe that this is an appropriate or an acceptable way to keep an owl. We shouldn't be tethering owls and we definitely shouldn't be keeping them in tiny little cages like they do in this film. It's, it's, it's shockingly bad. Do not think that that is okay. So, after Harry has got his wand, Hagrid appears with a present for him, a birthday present, and yet again, it is a snowy owl in a tiny little cage. And then this scene, I just, oh, it makes me so uncomfortable. So, not only have they got an owl in a tiny little cage, but it's a snowy owl. Snowy owls are prone to all kind of health complications because they are adapted to a very cold climate. Um, when we bring them into a warmer climate like here in England or any other place, they just don't tend to do well. But here they have a snowy owl in a little cage, indoors, with a burning log fire and it looks very smoky and dirty in this room and it just Oh god no, it's, that is not a safe or ideal place for an owl or any other bird of prey to be. They shouldn't be indoors, especially not in this kind of situation. That is not good for that owl. So moving on, we have gone over to the fourth Harry Potter film, The um, Goblet of Fire. Um, and Harry is taking a visit to the Owlery. Um, which has got all kinds of different owls co <laughs> covered in poo um, and this Eurasian eagle owl flies over but it's all black, I've never seen one like this before um, scientifically we'd call this melanistic so it's like kind of the opposite of albino or leucistic so it's melanistic Eurasian eagle owl, it looks very strange, I've never seen one I don't know if that's real, I don't know if somebody actually has a melanistic Eagle Owl, or if it's just been like CGI to be all black, it's strange. But what's also really bizarre is that it keeps making a barn owl's noise. 
We need to. It's, it's not the noise of a Eurasian eagle owl. It, the eagle owl is opening up his mouth and they've removed the audio and then they've got the audio of a barn owl, a completely different type of bird, not even same family, and they've superimposed a barn owl's screech over the eagle owl's noise. It is so bizarre to watch. If you know owls, it, it's really jarring and very strange to watch. But anyway, Harry Potter is very odd with the owls and everything that you can't, you can't get owls to deliver letters. I know it's supposed to be all magical, but it's just, it's bizarre, okay. Anyway, moving on. So next, I would like to take a look at Jurassic World and just this one scene in particular. Um, now, I love the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World films. Um, in my eyes, they could do no wrong, but I cannot deny how dreadfully awful this scene is. So let's just take a look first. Eyes on me. There's Owen Grady. Blue. Watch it. Charlie's a Blue Charlie, Echo and Delta. Shit. Delta, lock it up. Good. And we're moving. <laughs> That's good. That is damn good. Oh my God. Very good. See, Charlie? No. Yes. Echo. Right. So, the issue with this scene. So he is doing what a lot of people call clicker training. He's got a clicker. Um, it's also known as bridge training. Um, and it's, it's called bridge training because um, when you are training animals um, you have like a, a short period where you can reward an animal for doing something you wanted that animal to do um, in order for that animal to associate the reward with what they've just done. Um, typically a general rule is about three seconds so the animal does a behavior if you reward within three seconds that animal will typically um, understand that the reward comes from the behavior it's just shown you. So a clicker or bridge training just kind of extends that time a bit and it allows it, um, it allows it, it gives you a bit more time to give the physical reward. Now the way it works is you first off have to train the animal to understand the signal or the clicker. And so they then know that that clicker means they're going to get a reward. So then the way it's used is once they have shown a behavior you want, you do the clicker and they understand that that means they're going to receive a, war, uh, uh, receive a reward for the behavior they've just done. And it kind of just extends your time. It means you don't have to immediately get them a treat or a reward. And the way he's doing it is just, it's just, uh, it's completely wrong. Um, so he, First off, just start clickering it loads. You do not need to clicker it loads. You, it wants. You don't need to sit there and go click, 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 click. That's completely unnecessary. And all it's going to do is teach those animals to ignore the clicker rather than understand that it comes with a reward. And the very first thing he does, whilst clicking it loads, they've not done anything yet. He's clickering it to get their attention, which just doesn't make any sense at all. Then they finally do what he wants them to do, and he doesn't use the clicker. They all stood in the line and they all looked at him. That's when you would immediately do the clicker, which is rewarding them for standing and looking, and then they understood by hearing that clicker that that's what they were supposed to do, and then you can throw them a treat. But no, he doesn't. There's a big gap. Then he walks all the way around the bridge, and they follow him around, and again, <laughs> he doesn't clicker for them when they do what he wants. Again, there is a big pause. It just doesn't make any sense at all. So, although I love the Jurassic World films, this just makes no sense at all. So this is not how to do clicker training. So there was a few films that we have looked at. Um, some very good, some very 
interesting um, and strange uh, uses of training and birds of prey. Um, if you've enjoyed seeing this video, then please do leave a comment below of any more films or TV shows that have falconry or birds of prey featured and I will do a second video if enough of you have enjoyed this. Um, make sure to like and subscribe um, and for now thank you very much for watching.